My name is Thomas Milton Dews, Sr. I was born in 1917. I grew up in southwest Georgia. I was in the airborne part of the Army. I didn't even know about it much, but uh, it seemed to be exciting, and uh, it was not really in so well-known place. In fact, nobody knew just exactly what it was going to be, and I wanted to be a part of uh, developing it and making it the airborne. Well, I started out as a corporal, and I ended up as a captain. Most of my service was in France. I enlisted because in the history classes that I had taken in uh, college, we had a Dr. Flora who was a German and had escaped from the Nazis to the United States. And he told us what was going on in Germany and how the people were being treated and I was, I wanted to be a part of, of stopping that and keeping it from spreading with power by the Germans over other nations. Well, the war was a time of, of uncertainty and change. It was something that everyone you met and knew anything about was focused somehow on winning the war. And it was like, well, it was unlike anything that I had ever experienced. Everyone focused on one great mission. It was really a good thing to feel. We had had some feeling like this being built up during the Depression when people really helped each other that ordinarily they wouldn't even speak to each other but they realized, everybody realized, we, we got to help each other to get through this. And uh, that feeling was still left over from the Depression. And, uh, but it grew fast, and people were really helpful to each other and made great personal sacrifices to win the war. Do you remember where you were December 7, 1941? Yes, I was, I was getting ready that morning to go to Sunday school and church in uh, Clinton, South Carolina. And one of the boys came in across the hall in the college where I was and had heard on the radio that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. And my brother Kenneth was at Pearl Harbor. His ship was there. And, uh, of course, from there on, I was in the... I was in the army. <laughs> was your brother okay? He survived, yes. His ship was sunk, but he was able to jump overboard with his uh, shipmate. He, he, he was knocked out. Kenneth was, my brother Kenneth was in a hammock. His, his buddy was nearby shaving, standing on the deck. And the shock killed him, but it knocked him out. Kenneth thought he was just knocked out, so he took him and jumped in with him into the bay and went to, if you've been to Pearl Harbor, you know that where they put the ships, they have steps up these tall walls. He, he took him up those steps and took him to a a small church that they had made into a, a infirmary, temporary. And they looked at him and shook their head to him. So they took him and gave him a light machine gun. He'd never seen one before. He was in the Navy. And they put him out on the beach with that machine gun and other fellows like himself. And there they waited for an invasion they thought surely was coming from the infantry of the Japanese, but it, thank God, didn't come. They weren't ready for it. Well, after Pearl Harbor, I was allowed to finish my senior year of college, and I went from there. Ordinarily, in the class 
that graduated before me, they received a second lieutenant commission from the ROTC. But when war breaks out, you don't get that. You just get an appointment to the officer's candidate school, and then you go through a training process. So I was sent as a corporal to Fort Benning, Georgia, officer candidate school, 362, class 362, and graduated there as a second lieutenant. Well, it was so gradual, I left home to work and I left home to go to college, and so I, I was over that shock. <laughs> and uh, I always felt like home would be home and I could come back. So it didn't really bother me a lot until I started to go overseas. And I had a lump in my throat then about that. Can you tell me a little bit about what your training was like? Well, it was in the summer, and it was hot. And it was in a section of the country that I had grown up in, and I was somewhat conditioned to it. I felt sorry for the fellows from Brooklyn and places up north mm -hmm. that had never had that kind of heat before, and they, that's all they ever talked about. And they had kept saying, why don't we give this back to the Indians? Uh, they didn't like uh, Fort Benning at all. But anyway, um, I think uh, just the physical part of enduring uh, the training, regardless of what the training was, it was the hardest part of it, really. I, I liked some of it, I really did. I liked crossing the creek with all your equipment. And what you did, you you, you took all your equipment and you put it in a, a duffel bag and you took your rifle in one hand and your duffel bag in the other and you crossed the river. You had to swim, you walk sometime, but you had to learn how to cross the river with our equipment. And that was pretty, pretty scary. I didn't know at that time that I was going to be in the airborne. I was just training to be a second lieutenant in the infantry of the Army. I was sent to Camp Fannin, Texas, which was even hotter than, <laughs> than South Georgia at Fort Benning. And they made me, uh, I was mostly a teacher there. I, I was teaching map reading. My wife won't believe it because we get lost all the time. <laughs> but I was teaching ma map reading and uh, I was teaching the Browning automatic rifle, which became really, the, I think, the greatest instrument of war that we had in the infantry throughout the war. From Texas, I volunteered for the 88th Glider Infantry Regiment which was at Fort Meade, South Dakota, in an old cavalry base from Indian days. But there were beautiful buildings and a beautiful place. And there we were, we were taking really basic training with our troops and giving them the special training that they needed for the airborne. Well, primarily it consisted of tactical work in small groups going through the Black Hills at night or a two-day mission. We would have to find our way there. We'd have to not ever be seen. The, plane, the little small planes were going over us all the time, taking pictures if they saw us. Then they would drop sacks of flour on us. And when they dropped a sack of flour, you'd go report back to your camp because you were dead, you know? Oh, okay. And so uh, we would have to move at night and find our place, and they would have a mock bridge or something, you know, and we'd have to blow it up without being seen by the defending troops that were there. And then we'd have to make our way back. All, of, all the time, we'd be living on... Uh, K rations and water, that's all. And one time I was doing on one of those missions and there's two fellows from, from West Virginia. I think they'd been miners or something, but anyway, they wasn't gonna live off just that, uh, that K ration. 
and they had found a farm somewhere. I didn't see the farm. They found a farm, got some eggs from a farmer, and they were cooking eggs and fish. They had caught some fish out of the stream. And they knew that I had them because you weren't supposed to build a fire or smoke. They were smoking, they had a fire, and you know what they said to me? Hey, Lieutenant, come on, have some fish. I gave them something besides fish. <laughs> K rations was somewhat like uh, a pack you have for hikers with a lot of uh, uh, nuts, give you a lot of strength, but not a lot of weight to carry with you. And um, you, you, could, you learn to like it. It would have uh, in it uh, some chocolate in a little case, and you could stir it in some water. And if you, if it was, if you were able to build, build a fire, it, you'd have hot chocolate, you know. And it, it had cigarettes in every one of them, whether you smoked or not. You had cigarettes sticking out your ears. <laughs> so once you finished your specialized training, where did you go? Uh, we went then, having taken our small unit training, we went to Fort Bragg and we became a part of a division. We, we had just been a, a regiment and we became a part of the 13th Airborne Division. And we started our division training, which you do the same thing you, you've done in your small unit training, but you combine that now in coordination with the battalions and the other regiments and so forth. It's on a larger scale, and you have to learn how to do that to keep contact and so forth. And we, we took that in North Carolina at Fort Bragg and Camp McCall. Camp McCall is near Fort Bragg. They almost run together, you know. At what point were you sent to Europe? Well, we had two or three cancellations because of, like D-Day, our injuries and deaths were so, so many. And yet those units had to keep on pushing, pushing, so they needed replacements. Well, we were ready to go ourselves as a whole division. They cleaned us out of recruits and officers and so so we had to start over and do the training over again so that made us late into the last part of the, the war in Europe. Well we were sent to Sens, we were put in a permanent uh, caserne, the French called it, and uh, we were in uh, Auxerre and other places and we would move from there if we, if we got an alert Alert meant that we would move into our tents out in the country. On small farms, we would have a dirt place for the planes to take off and pull the gliders. So the gliders were parked on one side, the planes on the other side, and the Air Force people were over here, <clears throat> the airborne people over here. And we could, we could get into the glider. We'd get in about four o'clock. And we, they, during the alert, we would wait until about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. And the fellows would say, uh, Lieutenant, can I, I got to go to the front line. Forget it. They, didn't, they couldn't go out. We couldn't move. We had to be ready any minute. Because you see, in the airborne, you are behind the lines on the safety side, but you're just a few minutes from the conflict. So uh, if somebody goes to the bathroom, he's liable to be left there. The rest of it will be gone to, to the war. Well, I think for the most of the war, I was a first lieutenant. And first lieutenant basically is a teacher. But he's not a teacher that just teaches and then walks away. He's a teacher in the Army fashion. In the Army, you tell them what's what. You demonstrate what's what. 
they go through what's what, and then you examine them to see if they're ready. Otherwise, they start over again, and they go through the whole thing again. It's called basic training. And lieutenants are largely trainers. In the conflict and deployment, the lieutenant is doing the examination. And that's the real test. It's life or death. You've got to do it right for your sake and for your buddies. How did you communicate with your family while you were in Europe? V mail. V like that. Right. We could write it free. We didn't have to have a stamp. We write it on a certain little piece of paper, fold it up, and send it through the process. And of course, everybody read it. Uh, get intelligence. Be sure we weren't giving away anything. I remember when I was uh, in. Uh, VE day in Europe. Mm -hmm. I was in Sens and uh, the people came out into the streets, everybody out into the streets to play all kinds of musical instruments. But mostly the thing that went everywhere is roll out the barrel. Roll out the barrel. We'll have the barrel. Everybody was so happy. And we were happy too. But we found out that we were not through. They, they, we were number one in going back. They saved the ship for us because we were a division that hadn't been messed up. We hadn't been committed as a whole unit. Some of our units were used in World War Europe. But anyway, we had, we were rushed back and uh, got, we had a 15 day leave before going to Japan, <clears throat> Pacific. And while we were at home, we learned that they had dropped the, the bomb and we got a notice from the Army that we had another 15 days and that we were not going to the Pacific. So the war was over then. But uh, I don't remember exactly what, what they had where we were. I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So how did you feel when you heard the war had ended? I felt really wonderful. I think the greatest thing during the war for me was entering the New York Harbor and seeing the Statue of Liberty. I mean, brought tears to my eyes. Huh? And all of us had to get outside of that ship and look there she is, there she is. We were so happy. It meant home. Well, we were on the point system of getting out, and you had to have certain points. Of If you had children, you got points. How, how long you'd been in the Army gave you points, and how long you had served during the war gave you points. And uh, while I was at Fort Bragg, my... My first child, a son, was born. And if he'd been born on the 13th, I would have been able to get out six months earlier. But he was born on the 12th. And I'd already entered his name in at the county seat. And so I couldn't change that. <clears throat> and I I stayed on for six more months before I could go to the seminary and start my study. I was continuing my study because I had four years of preparation for the gospel ministry. Did you use the GI Bill for anything? I did. I used it for three years of seminary. Look back now, I wish I'd gone on, but uh, I had been so long. It took me seven years to get four years of, um, of college because I didn't have the money. I'd work a year and, and go to the college a while and then work a while and go to college a while. And it took me a long time. And then the, the Army, three more years during the war. And so 
I could have gone on for a doctorate under the GI Bill, but uh, what I want to do is, will I finally get to be a preacher? <laughs> and I was, and I took off. I went to my home church, the First Presbyterian Church of Albany, Georgia, as assistant pastor with the assignment of starting new Sunday schools and new churches in a growing city. And that was my first work. Do you remember about what year that was? That was 1949. Yeah, I stayed there until one of the Sunday schools became a church, an established church with a session, and and uh, actually I was I was preaching and all to the people that I'd gone to grammar school and high school with, and uh, I loved every one of them. They loved me. We we got along fine. The trouble is that we started out as a Sunday school, like you know, and I did everything. I cut the grass, you know. I got the building ready in the morning. I cleaned the building out. You know, I did everything. But as we grew and grew into a larger church and so forth, and they were elected as officers, I, I gave them special training in what they're supposed to do. And I'd been in the army, and when I told them to do something, they'd do it. They had to do it. These didn't have to do it. They said, oh, Tom, you've been doing that. You know, you can do that. <laughs> So I said, if you all don't do your thing, I'm going to leave you in the hand of a strange preacher to come in here, and he'll certainly expect you to do your job. And that's the way it worked out. After four years, I moved on. I expect some of the people where I was pastor never knew that I was a veteran of the war. I don't, I, I didn't refer to it. The thing about it was, you see, when I was ordained, you go down a street and there's five houses, three of them would have be a veteran of the World War II. It was so common and everything, you know, so you didn't even think about it. It was in later years, as we got more scarce or something, I don't know, but people started asking for somebody to come to the school, come to the club and so forth, talk about World War II. And uh, you realize that that was a special time in the history of our nation. Yeah. When you first came back, you didn't talk about your experiences no. with people? No, no, I didn't talk. I don't think my children ever heard me talk about that. Really? Now, the older children, when we came, when I came back, the older children, they wanted every little thing I had that w was a soldier, you know, things that I brought back and so forth. And they cleaned me out because they had these plays at school about World War II, you know, and they had to have those things. And when they start dipping in there, well, who knows where it goes. <laughs> kids will be kids. Well, we go to the schools and talk to children about World War II, and we try not to talk about, uh, what they want to know is, have you stepped on any dead people and their eyes came out and stuff like that, you know, we don't want to talk about that. And I tell them about the, in the Army, one of the hardest things to stand was nothing going on, nothing, nothing to do. Play ball, play softball, uh, play tag football, just do anything like that, but all that gets tired, you get tired, and you wonder where the war is and what's going on, and you don't know anything, you're bored still. And so we learn to entertain ourselves with different kind of uh, musical instruments and so forth. And uh, we would sing a song that we learned from the British Airborne. They call themselves the Para. Para comes from the Greek word, which means to descend. And they, they had a good word for it. They call them the para. Uh, we call them paratroopers. And uh, anyway, uh, we, we learned that song. We, uh, we asked them if we could use it. Yeah, 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 you could use it. And they learned some of ours. But it's, uh, it's, it's called, uh, what is the name of it? It just says Airborne Song, World War II. Okay. I've got sixpence, 
Jolly, jolly sixpence. I've got sixpence to last me all my life. I've got tuppence to spin and tuppence to lend and tuppence to send home to the wife, poor wife. <laughs> no cares have I to tease me. No pretty little girls to deceive me. I'm happy as a lark, believe me, as we go rolling home, rolling home, rolling home, rolling home, rolling home, rolling home, by the light of the silvery moon. Happy is the day when the airborne gets its pay, as we go rolling home, rolling home. <laughs> that was fantastic. Now, when we do that for the school children, then they have to sing it back to me. Well, I won't be singing, but <laughs> well, you can get me off camera. How about that? It's your time. <laughs> we'll wait to the end of the interview for that. <laughs> okay. I've often looked back and wondered, why is it that those three or four years made such a tremendous impression on me over other places and experiences that I had? I keep going back to that, and I think it was that bond that you feel when you're under the under the threat, constant threat of war, of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, of going through all that. You just bond, so it, I think that's what it is. I don't know. Others, have, other soldiers have talked about it the same way. That's that short time compared to other things. Uh, it stands out. I don't know why. I told you about the Statue of Liberty, didn't I? Yes, sir. That beautiful girl, wonderful. She's still there. Thank God. I I want to tell you this. Veterans are not just interested in telling you about what they did and didn't do, so forth in the war. We want to tell you that as long as we breathe a breath of air, we want to support our present day troops and we want to support our government and we want to still make this America a greater nation than it has ever been. And we have to tell the young people the coming generations about patriotism and what it means. And that's what we're up to. Airborne, all the way. <laughs>